I'm rolling right now, yeah. And it looks sharp there. Three, two, one. Welcome to Dropping In from Omega Institute, a podcast that explores the many ways to awaken the best in the human spirit. I'm Callie Alpert. Dropping in today, Lisa Williams. Lisa is a renowned psychic medium, best-selling author, television personality, and spiritual teacher. Born in England, she was discovered by Merv Griffin and introduced to audiences through two seasons of her own hit show, Lisa Williams' Life Among the Dead, along with Voices from the Other Side and Lisa Williams Live. Lisa also offers courses in psychic mediumship through the Lisa Williams School of Spiritual Development. Her mission is to bring healing, hope, and guidance to anyone seeking the answers to life's greatest questions. Welcome, Lisa. It's so nice to have you. Thanks for dropping in today. Thank you. It's so lovely to be here. So nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. And you were just saying that, what were you just saying about this space just before we started rolling? So this space is so incredible. Um, I haven't spent enough time here and that's my fault. And I really encourage everyone to come here because the energy <laughs> is just amazing. Um, so yeah, it's just, you just want to sit here and just take it all in. It's beautiful. Our Ramdas Library, I'm glad you enjoy it. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for that. So let's start with the early days of you recognizing your gift as a little girl in England. Mm -hmm. I know your grandmother and I think also your aunt were psychic. That's right, yes. Right? And your parents thought you were a little kooky, <laughs> right? So where did you first start recognizing, where did you first find the validation? Like when you first started seeing entities and feeling energies, mm -hmm. did you have someone to go to or did you harbor it to yourself? Like how did you even handle that as a little kid with no frame of reference? So I didn't have a frame of reference and you're absolutely right because when it all started to manifest itself within me, I was four years old and my grandmother at the time she was, you know, my grandfather was still alive, so it was all behind closed doors. And she, was, she hadn't quite come out herself as doing psychic medium work. And when he died, at the, when I was seven years old, um, I remember my grandmother saying to me, I just got a vivid memory of going, she's like me. And mm. I just remember her being in the house and her, her saying to my mom, she's like me, and and my mom, my my mom's like, oh, my dad's like, oh, forget that, and it was so interesting, but I, I didn't really go to her. I had no frame of reference. I was just thought everybody did this, and and I think. One of the things that was very interesting is when I was probably four or five is I, we were lived in like in a block of apartments and I looked over and my mom had the curtains shut for some reason, old school. And I looked down and I'm waving at this guy and she said, come away, come away. And I went, why? And I said, come away. And I'm waving at this guy on a motorcycle and he's waving at me. And my mom went, there's a funeral, stop it. And little did I know, they were actually at the funeral for the guy who died on the oh. motorcycle. And he was there waving at me. And I thought, well, it's normal. But I didn't really embrace it until I was much older. Because at that time, back in the, you know, 70s, 80s, it was all shoved away. Mm. Shh, don't say anything. And I think it was only really until my grandmother did it that, and my grandmother said, you've got the gift too, that I went, oh, okay, now it makes sense. As you describe the um, experience at age four as a little girl, it begs the question, how does one separate between, because kids have very active imaginations and creativity, but also perhaps somebody with your lens mm -hmm. would say that imagination and creativity are just unfiltered, like being tapped in at an early age before we get layered with all of right. the, you know, life and all the things that kind of close our channels, mm -hmm. right? So did you know how to separate out between imagination and having a, um, your gift? So I was always branded with having an overactive imagination. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting because now I tell my students, imagine, create. Because our brain doesn't understand what is fact and what is fiction. So when we start to recognize what is fact and fiction, then we go, oh, that's wrong. And so the creative mind actually needs to expand. It needs to think of the wealth of possibilities that are out there. And so 
I didn't know what it was. Now I recognize that it, my creative brain, my opportunity to, because I was very musical, very artistic, very creative. I was not the academic. I was constantly in that space. I was constantly creating, constantly making up wild ideas. And it was, it was reality to me. And so for me, I don't think I understood it until much later and now I'm teaching. But at the time, I just, I think I just accepted it. And I just accepted being, I know it sounds weird, but I accepted being weird. I didn't like it, but it kind of made me a little bit stand out from the crowd, if that makes sense. And I was okay with that. It never really kind of got me down. That's really interesting in and of itself, because often when you hear people talking about being different as children, which a lot of us can relate to, all you want to do is fit in and have more mm -hmm. of a status quo sort of acceptance. And the fact that something inside of you knew or knew to validate your differentness yeah. is pretty powerful. That's pretty early for most people to experience such, such a thing, I think. It really was early. And, you know, I, I think back now to my high school years and I realized that my dad always said, you should have gone to acting school, Lisa, <laughs> because I was, I used to be okay on stage. I, you know, of course I wanted to fit in and I would get very upset and say, no, but I saw it. I, but then the more I started to experience it, the more some of the kids were like, can you tell me what color such and such is going to be wearing, you know, or what is going to happen? Are we going to get the test tomorrow? And so though I, it kind of came a novelty in a way, yes, I wanted to fit in, but it also gave me that, hmm, you want me kind of thing. And I, because I wasn't part of the in crowd, <laughs> I guess, mm -hmm. but it also made me that, oh, she's interesting. So I, I was, it, it was just interesting time really back, back then. When did you first discover that your gift could heal people? Wow, that's a good question. I don't think I realized that my gift could heal people until much later into doing readings. Mm. So, you know, I thought at the time it was just, oh, I need to earn extra money, so I'm gonna do readings on the side. And then the more I started to do this and the more tears that flowed and the more people that knocked at my door and the more people that wanted the connection, that I started to realize there was a deeper need. Mm. And interestingly enough, um, I became a psychic junkie myself because there was go something going on in my life and I kept turning to psychics, turning to psychics, turning to psychics until there was a moment where I went, stop. You now have to rise above all of this, change your ethical approach and actually become something of value. And it was at that point, and I've probably been doing this work about five years at that point, and it was at that point that I went, I have to make sure that no one else becomes codependent upon a reading so that they cannot do their own life. And I think that's when I started to realize the impact of this work and that I was just here to heal. Do you say that because in, in terms of your experience, because you were experiencing a lot of sort of charlatans or people that weren't really treating you with the integrity that Like yeah. To see. So it was, you know, the experience was is, you know, you were on the phone with these people and it was late at night and she said, you know, what this card means is this, 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 this. What this card means is this, this. And I went, are you reading it from a book? And she <laughs> said, yeah. And I literally just put the phone down and I went, wow. And it was just money, 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 money. And I thought, you are scamming on the people that are so needy, so desperate. And I think that's when I changed my whole philosophy mm -hmm. because, and now I carry that through and, it's, and that, was, that was 22 years ago. And now I carry that through in my whole everything because people turn to us more than they do therapists. They turn to us for so many ways. And I'm like, if I can just help one person, it's integrity, it is coming with authenticity, it is my ethical approach. I'm not here to harp on someone's, you know, misfortune or anything. And I think it's very important that we raise the ethical standard and make this industry now professional. Mm -hmm. 
and, and the professional ethics and have a credibility about it because the world needs hope. To and say the least, it does. That's what we're providing. You mentioned the circumstances that are often referred to as like the spiritual bypass mm -hmm. or when someone's in mourning or pain, they can't skip the steps because you have to walk through the emotionality of, right. of a loss. And yet it's also a very natural inclination for many people to turn to somebody like mm -hmm. you. How do you walk that line with people that you know and don't know, even just representing your industry? How do you encourage people to find healing in the emotional, psychological realm, and then also at the same time support the kind of work that you do? So it's twofold. Um, one of the biggest things that I actually say to people is, please do not come to me much before three months. Because I t talk about a three month window, because that's your, that's your own sacred time to do your own healing. Now, there are extenuating circumstances that that can change, such as they had a reading scheduled and then suddenly, sadly, a death happened. And that's when I go in very carefully and I'm very, listen, please do not keep going to psychics and mediums to get answers. Mm -hmm. So I, I really encourage that. But then what I found recently in my work, what I've been doing is I've been doing a lot of help with families of people who are transitioning. And so the family, and I've been working a lot with hospice, where people have been asking me in hospice, why are they holding on? Can you tell them? Can you communicate with them? And in that space of me communicating to the soul on a soul-to-soul -soul level, I'm then able to pro provide comfort to the family. Listen, they're hearing you. They're ready. The body is just going through its process. And so... What I'm able to do is connect with the family and, and bring them the comfort and the final messages mm -hmm. before the transition. And it recently happened in my life. And the guy, one of my dearest friends, I was doing it for his family. And he came through with so much gratitude that I was able to communicate. And then after that, I went, listen, I would love to communicate with you and bring him through, but now it's time for you to heal. Now it's time for you to take your time, do what you need to do. You're never gonna heal that hole, but to do what you need to do to make it easier, to go through the pain, to go through the upset, to go through the sadness, and then we'll celebrate him. And I think that's the most important thing. I, I have never heard this concept before. I love the idea of a psychic medium working with people almost in a palliative way before mm -hmm. they cross over. Yep. That's so amazing. That it's, must be so helpful. It is one of my biggest passions. Wow. And I've found recently I've been called upon more and more and more. And what I've actually started, and I'm actually going to be teaching a class on this. And what I found is there is a way to communicate with the, the spirit, the soul, when they are you know, asleep or they're in, on morphine or they, they're going through their transition. And what I'm noticing is it's not much different communication-wise from the deceased to the living. And as they're going through this transition, they still need a voice. They may not be able to speak, but they want to go, hey, I'm having fun. Oh, my God, what did, why did you have pizza last night? You, you don't eat pizza. You know, all of those things. And that confirmation is that feeling of, they're hearing me, which also brings about stop arguing over the bedside. You know, don't talk about the funeral over the bedside. Can you go out the room because they're hearing this? Those sort of conversations. And by the way, they'd want to wear the pink shirt, not the pink lipstick or this, that, you know, and it's so interesting. And I remember walking into my friend's funeral and, you know, I wasn't, close fa family and his mom and dad came running out, grabbed me into the family room, hugged me and said, we cannot thank you enough for what you did and what you've done and how you've helped. And, and they, they said, we hope he's going to be happy with the funeral because it's everything that was suggested by you. And it was everything. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So now what I feel 
is important is to educate other psychics and medium, mediums how to do that with care, with compassion. What is this work, be it the work you've been doing for decades as a channel or helping people transition now, do for your relationship with death? Oh, wow. Good question. You know, I think for me, it's made me more peaceful. It's made me appreciate, look, I'm here to serve. I'm here to, for a, a reason. I'm here for a period of time. I don't look at death as a, a problem. I look at it as a natural transition. I look at it as long as I'm, you know, it's going to be peaceful and everything else. I'm okay with it. Um, I mean, we all just want to fall asleep and go in our sleep, really. I mean, let's face it. But I had to come to terms with it in my own way, facing death and realizing that I can't control anybody else's passing. I can't control when someone's going to pass. We all have our own life path. And really, it's just for me to really give the, the give them the best experience that I can in that period of time, whether it be family or friends, and just accept mm. that it is a natural part of life. Have you ever healed parts of you with your own channeling? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I wrote a book called Divine Wisdom, mm -hmm. and that Divine Wisdom was me having difficulties in my life and literally saying, okay, spirit, help me. And I would be sitting on aircraft. So I would be sitting in, in, you know, at the stump in Lilydale, or I'd be sitting on in my car waiting for a meeting. And it would just be a, a quick download. Da -da -da -da, and I would type it out and I read it after. And I'm like, wow. And so absolutely, you know, if you've got the gift, use it for yourself too. Has your channel, your spirit team, your gift changed over the decades since you started doing this work? All the time. How um, has it changed? So, you know, my, my master guide, Ben, um, he hasn't changed, but then other people have changed. And I think for me, I've gotten stronger. Mm. I, my, it's become clearer, it's become strong. And it's so funny because I scratch my nose, that's when spirit comes in, it's so weird. <laughs> But it's, it's, it's because it's, I have to listen. My energy has just increased. Um, when I need to listen, it's like they're there. I feel this presence. And the team themselves, if I'm going through something, they'll change. Or if I'm teaching a certain topic, they'll change as well. So I think, you know, it's constantly evolving. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd all be bored if we worked with the same people every day. So I feel that it's all a variety. It's very important for us to have that family. And it is your family. Oh, right? absolutely. It is my family. Yeah, <laughs> they're more than my family. Yeah. <laughs> is your family bigger in spirit world or on um, earth plane? Um, so it, I think my family is bigger on the spirit world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now I've got extend, extended family in the spirit world as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, with my husband's wife, former wife that transitioned. So mm. it's just become extended constantly, yeah. Do you find um, that you have to be super protective of your energy or is it more of an endless reserve? Do you feel like you have to find ways to replenish? I wish it was an endless reserve. Mm. Um, I think it's very important that you protect your own energy. Um, for me, I very much have hardcore boundaries. So what I like to do is I like to, I, I pull myself back. I used to say I was such an extrovert. I'm now one of those introverted people. I pull away. I do my own thing. And I also am very healthy because I'm very careful about my vessel. My vessel is sacred. If my vessel is not 100%, then how am I able to do my job? And I feel that I'm constantly learning how this all works and how our vessel is so important. You know, and I think it's also part of getting older, <laughs> naturally, but it's, it's important to actually take care of ourselves. And one of those is boundaries and sleep. So do you have a daily practice? I do have a daily practice. Um, my daily practice 
starts at night. It's very important because I make sure I go to sleep. I make sure I set an intention before I go to sleep and I make sure I have really solid, good sleep. And then I wake up in the morning and then I do my meditation. And when I wake up, that meditation could be for a variety of different things. I always say there's two types of meditation, one purposeful, let me connect with my guides, and one has to be for self. So my morning is always for self. And then I make sure I try to walk and I make sure that I am healthy. So I, you know, I look after my body with what I take in or the supplements. And, and then I'm, I have to have an hour and a half for myself in the morning, whatever it might be. I think it's important to learn. I think it's important to study. I think it's important to grow. I think it's important to journal. And those are some of the things that I'll incorporate in that time. And then later on in the day, it's, it's so weird because I feed the dogs and then I meditate. It's weird. And so I feed the dogs and as they're doing their thing, I will sit there for the time afterwards and I'll just be. Mm. And I'll just have that maybe 15, 20 minutes just... And guaranteed the dogs are on me, you know, but it's like just finding peace. And I think that's important. I've heard you talk about the belief and, and as a teacher um, that everybody has this gift to some degree or mm -hmm. another, right? And that they just need to tap into it or open up to it. Is anybody exempt from that or do you believe that everybody really is included in that? I think um, from what I've seen, everybody has, has the gift, mm. okay? It's certainly where intuition is concerned. You know, even the most skeptical person, i.e. my husband, he will have this intuitive vibe and he's like, I just feel, and I'm like, what's going on with you? But if he wanted to hone his skill and his ability, he could. Now, I, I see it as being someone who is a singer, there are some people who have got the natural ability of singing, and then there are some people that don't have the natural ability. But with the f tweaks and lessons, they could definitely hold a tune, and they could sing within their range, and they can sing. So I think really it's how much you want it. How much are you willing to work at it? How much do you want to put yourself into that space and say, I can do it, because I do feel as though anyone can do it. Can you speak to what seem like universal signs when everyday people believe they're experiencing visits from the other side, where electricity starts getting funky mm -hmm. or a phone rings and there's no one there, or a song comes on or a smell becomes pervasive in the room, but there's no explanation. Mm -hmm. Are those truly signs and how does that happen? Of course, they're signs. They're absolutely signs. So um, it's, it's kind of um, a multitude of things. So let's say, for instance, pennies from heaven. Mm. Very common thing. It's not like our loved ones went, quick, she's coming. Let's go and drop a penny. Okay, it's not. What they've done is they are, the penny's already there. They've influenced you to look at it. They've, they've pulled your mind down to go, oh, there's a coin there. Um, the music, again, the music is around, but it's, um, uh, it's us going, huh, and you're hearing it. There's an influence from spirit. Hey, listen, and you could be in like a grocery store and be like, oh my God, that piece of music, that was my wedding song. Oh, you know, and it's because spirit has influenced you as if say, I'm still here, I'm still here. The electricity, it's the spirit connection because spirit uses electricity. So they're connecting with us. They're like vibing with us. The bookshelf that, you know, the book that drops off the shelf, I hope nothing goes right now. <laughs> but <clears throat> they're actually going to be like, hey, we've been warning you about something. Now we're going to make you sit up and listen. So these signs are everywhere. You know, just looking out into the clouds, what do you see in the clouds? When, they, when spirit pop into your mind, when your loved ones pop into your mind with a memory, don't you think that that's them coming through and saying, hey, come on, listen. So they're all around us. We just overthink it. We just go, oh no, we can't. 
but we have to really just go, okay, I accept. Now, here's the other part of it. There are some people who will go, now, Dad, if you're around, you're going to give me a sign at 4.45 tomorrow afternoon, and it's going to be this. Well, he's just going to laugh at you, and he's going to send that sign in a totally different time, a different way, and because we can't dictate it. We have to allow it to come, because I know people will do it. I've done it. We've all done it. So I think it's important that we recognize that spirit's going to have to work their own way. You referenced your book, Divine Wisdom. You wrote that in 2018, I believe it came yes. out, right? And um, you did share a lot of wisdom for the masses about what spirit wants us to know. Mm -hmm. Here we are now in a very trying time with so much chaos and dismantling and challenges and struggles and countless issues mm -hmm. and divisions. What does spirit want us to know that you're aware of that can help us process, understand, find some relief, some peace? So it's interesting because while we were going through the pandemic, I dedicated myself to 101 days of messages. Mm -hmm. And they gave me all of this information, all of this wisdom, which I shared on social media. And what came out from that was, we're in time of change. We can't just be blind. We can't just ignore. Now it's a time to stand up for your belief, to stand up for who you are, to stand up for what you want. And that we have to find peace within ourself and love within ourself before we can start spreading the love and the peace because it starts within us. And we are being forced to see things differently. We are being forced to see the world in such a powerful way that we have to recognize the peace within us. So what do you suggest? What are some actual steps that people can take to try to, number one, find that inner love and that inner balance and then take that outward? Because it's a lot. It is a lot. And it's a lot of pressure. And there is a, a huge amount of pressure on individuals to go, what is my purpose in life? What is my purpose for me to do this work? How do I need to show up? And honestly, I would recommend that they sit back and go in, journal, meditate, find that peace within themselves, and then get the guidance, whether it's from their higher self, whether it's from spirit, whether it's from wisdom that they read, just take that moment just to go, okay, what is it that I need? And then once there's a feeling, share something, share that passage, share a little bit of writing that you did, share something that helped you with your neighbor, your friend, and be compassionate and find kindness and share in that love because it's the ripple effect. I'm not here to change everyone's lives and to convince everyone about mediumship. Someone here is gonna be listening to this and then share it and share and share and share. And all I'm doing is dropping something in the ocean and the ripple is going out. And that's all it is. So you have embarked on a, re on a relatively new chapter in studying psychology and neuroscience. Yes. Can you tell me what prompted it and exactly what and why? So I've always been fascinated with the brain. And obviously over the pandemic, you know, everyone was coming to me for learning. And I thought to myself, if I do not learn, how can I help others? And I became fascinated by the medium's brain. And I started to understand, how do we get messages? How does it come? Because people ask me all the time in my teachings, how do we do this? And so I went, I'm going to learn this. And so I did, uh, as I did a very short course at Sloan School of Man at Sloan School with MIT. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try it. And I learned so much about how our intuition works through the vagus brain, through the vagus nerve into the limbic system, and how our gut has to be really, you know, real good gut health and to make sure our intuition is firing off, you know, all about the importance of sleep and nutrition and water and everything else, everything that I suspected. And I went, hmm, 
there's more to this. And then I started to look at the way the pandemic was going and I started to see all the mental health problems and how as mediums and psychics, I am carrying someone's life in the palm of the hands, not just for the hour that they're with me, but for the rest of their life. Because you can guarantee that someone can't remember what they had for dinner yesterday, but they will remember word for word what somebody said in a psychic reading or a medium. <laughs> Absolutely, you're gonna remember it for years, whatever you chose to hear. And so I thought there's more to it. I needed to understand it. And so I embarked on a master's degree of uh, psychology and neuroscience to really try to understand the concept of how the medium's brain works. Because it's never really been done. There are studies by Yale and there's other studies that are actually happening. But these are scientists, Joe Dispenza is one of them, they're scientists who are bringing into spirituality. I haven't really seen anyone that's going spirituality and now proving it was science. So I pulled my big girl panties up and I went, I'm gonna do it, which is a big daunting task. But there is a lot of correlation between having a healthy brain and the limbic system, which is, is you know, the amygdala, the hippocampus, everything with the emotional part of our brain that we actually as mediums tap into. And so now I'm, I'm trying to help where people think, oh, you're really weird. Oh, you're, you know, you're mentally ill because you speak to spirit. So trying to understand the difference between psychosis and mediumship. And it's so powerful. And my tutors are now addressing it, which I find is wonderful. So I kind of want to, by doing these studies, normalize what we do, bring it into, make it more professional and allow science to have some part in this. Because before it's just been, oh, it's just energy. Well, there's got to be a science behind energy. <laughs> Let's understand the science. Let's understand the mind. And that's what I plan on doing. So, yeah. It's a big task. It is. Yeah. In your free time to take something like that on, right? Yeah. I, it's almost like the um, like creating a new study, the physiology of intuition and yeah. psychic abilities is yeah. what I'm hearing and trying to uh, really find the more physical and physiological scientific root of it. And I did a study um, over the pandemic with many mediums and I, I made them go through, you know, document what their sleeping habits were, their eating habits, you know, how they drank their water and what it was like when they were doing readings and how connected they were. And it worked out that above 90% were like, when we're sleeping good, we have no stress, we are eating well, we are drinking our water and we're exercising, we've got the oxygen that we are able to do it. And the connection is so powerful. And Re, you know, rewiring the brain, going through simple neuroplasticity of allowing, allowing people who are coming into the industry, because there's been an influx of people coming into the psychic medium industry, and understanding that they have to think differently. And you working out is gonna help grow those neurons and, and rewire those neurons for what you need to do. With everything in mind, that you, this course that you're on right now, what is your hope for mediumship and its relationship with society, let's say in the next five years, 10 oh. years? My hope in the next five years that mediumship will become more and more accepted, more and more professional, that there will be an awareness and the ability to help others. And I feel that it's a really important part of life. It's actually a really important part of death. You know, I would really love it that we could incorporate our services into funeral directors, into hospices, into helping with the transitions, working with the death doulas in so many different ways because we are just the beginning. There is no end, but we are the beginning of the communication to the other side. And what we're actually able to do is to prove to people life continues on. And it's for us, mediumship is changing. Everyone can do mediumship. People are starting to believe now, 
but we now have another purpose, that there's more out there that we have to do. It's not just communicating with grandma who knits and you know little doilies and everything else. Now we have a purpose to help heal families, to heal the soul, to help the soul transition, to be there in times of need and just really understand that there is that purpose and to make it normal. And I've realized that I'm bringing credibility and professionalism into an industry where people are seeking to learn about the afterlife or to learn about the spiritual industry. And I had to realize that there has to be a professionalism because as someone who, I guess, is in the industry at quite a high level, there's a massive responsibility at my, my shoulders. And I could just content, continue on, but if I want to, now I've got to change it and make it more professional. And that's how I went, okay, I'm doing it. I, finally, I have three rapid fire questions okay. that I like to ask all of our faculty that join us here and dropping in. The first one is I'd like to grant you one wish for our listeners and viewers today. What would you grant them? I would grant them peace and hope and realize that there, you can find peace and hope within. And it's really just a belief. And what's one wish you'd like to grant yourself? My one wish that I'd like to grant myself is happiness, that I continue to remain happy doing what I do in a lifestyle that I, I love and being able to be happy. And finally, what would you like our viewers and our listeners to take away one thing from our conversation today if you had to choose? That there is an afterlife and it's just about choice. And that really, if you choose to believe in it, there's a whole wealth of opportunity out there waiting for you. So if people would like to find out more about you and all your endeavors, where can they find you? They can go to lisawilliams.com or social media, um, and anywhere like that. But really, lisawilliams.com is the best place. Thank you so much. Yeah. I want to thank you. What a beautiful thank you. conversation to have with you. Thank you for making the time. Oh, it's been a pleasure. It's been amazing. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for dropping in with Omega Institute. If you like what you see, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. To listen to the audio version of Dropping In, find us on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Dropping In is made possible in part by the support of Omega members. Omega members enjoy a host of beneficial experiences when they donate to help sustain Omega's programming. To learn more, visit eomega.org slash membership and check out our many online learning opportunities featuring your favorite teachers and thought leaders at eomega.org slash online learning. I'm Callie Alpert, producer and host of Dropping In. Our video editor is Granel Knox. The music and mix are by Scott Mueller. Thanks for dropping in.